Once you find your place. Revelation 4. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that w sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was as a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Holy, 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 worthy, O Lord, we're talking about today. First thing that you notice when you look at this, and I'm, I'm focusing more on the second half of this chapter, beginning in verse 6, is the four beasts. These angelic beings, referred to as beasts, are one that often takes and grabs a hold of our attention because they're such a strange phenomenon. And we don't see these things every day, obviously. There's something that is supernatural, something that is of the spiritual realm. And so it's something that when we read about it, it's a little hard for our minds to wrap around. And yet you see God often take things that are spiritually difficult to discern and he'll give them an earthly application so that we can at least get a glimpse in our minds of what these things might appear as. Regarding specifically angelic beings, we know that quite often they appear unto men simply as men. We know in the case of, of Lot that the angels came into the door and they pounded on the door and they said to Lot, where are the men which came in unto thee? They, they wanted to know them, but they, they knew them specifically, though they might have been more holy than those around them, they knew them as men, they recognized them as men. And there are many other such cases where until a miracle had happened or until something of great phenomenon had happened, uh, the angels were recognized simply as a man like you and I would, would know a man. And so there wasn't anything that they could specifically grab a hold of. But these winged angels are something that's different, something that's very peculiar indeed unto us. And so specifically, turn if you would, keep your finger in Revelation 4. I want to go to Ezekiel chapter 1 and grab a hold of one of the types of winged, um, angelic beasts that we find. In Ezekiel chapter 1, in verse 3, Ezekiel chapter 1, in verse 3, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Okay, so here we have Ezekiel, the priest. He's down in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. There with the hand of God upon him is about to see this vision before him. Verse 4 says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud of fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. 
Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. They four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus was their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings, everyone joined one to another and two covered their bodies. And they went everyone straight forward, whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. And this is a great sight for us if we were to behold such a thing. And here, I think Ezekiel almost struggles to describe what he's seeing. He, he's giving it into a, into a context or into a type of language where we could understand, right? With the lightning, with the animals, with the movement of these creatures. But even still, it's something that you'd have to maybe read over again and again and again to try to really get a grasp of what he was beholding here. We see these group of angels, these four, are described as living creatures. Each one of them has the likeness of a man, and yet there is a straightness to their feet. In other words, where our feet go down and turn at a 90 degree angle out, there was, theirs were straight down, almost like the feet of, a, of, a, of an ox or the feet of some sort of um, an hind or a deer type of thing. Straight down were their feet. And yet they had the hands of a man and still bear the overall resemblance of a man. And yet there was something very different about these creatures with that they had four faces. The Bible describes that the forward-facing face was one of a man, and yet on the left-hand side there was a face of the ox, on the right-hand side there was a face of a lion, and on the rearward there was the face of an eagle. Interestingly, these had four wings. Two of them flew up in the air and conjoined with the other four that, that the angels that were with them, and the others came down and they enwrapped and enfolded the body. These creatures, and if you were, you could turn to Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 15, are what is known as Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 15, and the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Kibar. And you can write in your Bible there the connection that was made. So we see that these creatures are known, these living creatures are known as the cherubims. Okay, They had fire in their appearance, as a lamp that burned. They moved as lightning, the Bible describes, and that as the flash of lightning, so was their appearance. Almost that they would move from one place to another, and yet they never turned when they went, but every one of them went straight forward. And so that face of the man was always before them. Now, if you would, go to Isaiah, and that's a few books before Ezekiel. You're going to go past the great big book of Jeremiah, to Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to look at a different type of angelic being, one that makes up the host. In Isaiah chapter 6, I always love this story. In Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am done, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So this group of angelic hosts had this experience with Isaiah. It was, it was part of Isaiah's original calling to the ministry to preach unto all of these nations. And God sent the angelic host as, as, as before him, as he often does, from his throne to have this experience with Isaiah. And when he saw him, he... 
he, he nearly fell at his feet. He, he con confessed that he was undone. He confessed that he was a man of unclean lips. Woe is me, I have seen the king sitting upon the throne. And the seraphim came to him and gave him that, that assurance that his sin was purged before him by giving him the hot coal upon his lips and saying, hey, you've been called to this ministry. But what I want to grab hold of specifically is the fact that these creatures are known as the seraphim, and I think these are the ones that are actually being referred to at the end of the whole Bible in the book of Revelation, because you see they had six wings. The cherubim had four. The seraphim had six. These six wings, two covered the face of the, of the seraphim. Two covered the feet of the seraphim, and with the two they did fly. The one thing that really grabs a hold of my attention and points it to the ones in Revelation is the song that they sing. They cried one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with his glory. And this seems to be the constant song, the constant cry there of the seraphims. So in Revelation chapter 4, back in verse 6, we see that same thing is being proclaimed by them at the end of verse 8, rather. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And these are an interesting creature because it describes them in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. There's another tell because we saw way back in Isaiah that he saw the Lord in his throne high and lifted up. And there the seraphims found their place. And here... John, in the book of Revelation, sees the throne. He sees the sight of the throne, the lightnings coming from it, and the seraphims find their place there around the throne of God. Holy, 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 they're crying, and next to the high and lifted up throne of God. Verse 7 says, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying Eagle. So there's two ways I think you can interpret this. And honestly, if you go on the internet, you're just going to see a whole bunch of pictures that people make up in their own minds. But we see that the eyes here are before and behind this living creature. That's what it says at the end of verse 6. Then it describes the different faces of them. So there's one of two things that have happened here. Maybe the cherub has, or maybe the seraph has the same outlook as the cherub, where he has one of each type of face looking in all directions. That would cover the idea of the eyes being before and behind. But I don't necessarily believe that's the case because if you continue to read, I think it's more likely that these are separate beasts and the eyes that are talking about being before and behind are something that is added to their appearance or added to their likeness. Because that's what verse 7 indicates. It says, like as a lion was the first beast, right? And it says, and the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So this doesn't indicate to me that they have all of those visages in one, but perhaps that they are separate and distinct. Especially when you see it says it had a face as a man, the third beast there. So it was a singular face. It wasn't like what we saw in the cherubs where they had all of the faces round about them. So what I think it is is that while they are all seraphim, they, they may be manifest in the different sites, or they just, each one of them has a different distinct appearance. They look a little bit different one from another, even though they're of the same breed, let's say, of angels. One will look like a lion, one will look like a calf, one will have a face as a man, and one will look like a flying eagle. Either way, they, are, they have six wings about, and as you read about in Isaiah, they cry, Holy, 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 they're before the throne. And so that's what makes me think that they are of the seraph brand, of the seraph group. Now, the make of them like, is, is kind of unclear. It's, it's kind of hard to get a hold of this. And you could go and you could probably study out many different portions of the scriptures that, that talk about this. But one thing that I want to look at is the specific beast that they're being associated with. No matter what type of angelic creature you find, there's a specific beast that they're being associated with. It's interesting to see that these are, have a particular role, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So each type of 
the beasts that cry out will be in the book of Revelation chapter 6, making a proclamation to come and see before each one of the seals is open. And so they play that part, and I think the type of animal that they represent, or the human as the third beast, will indicate the type of judgment that's being poured out from man at this time, from Antichrist at this time. But we'll get a little bit more of that later. But when you find the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle brought to our understanding in that order and, and the visage of the angels, I honestly think that that points a little bit to the Gospels that we read about, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because you'll find traits of the animals that are being referred to contained within the context of those very scriptures. We know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are kind of the similar. John's the different one that tells a lot of different stories. But if you read them all in unison, one after another, you'll find that each of them kind of tell a little bit of a different type of a story. Um, in Matthew, which I would say is associated with the first beast being the lion, you will find Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is the most Jewish of all the books. This is the one book, the one gospel, that gives the most uh, homage to the Old Testament scriptures, where it will constantly be quoting the Old Testament, constantly be bringing the Old Testament into the context of Jesus' life. And it most often refers to the Old Testament, because I think Matthew was a book more than any that was particularly trying to get the Jews to be on board. Matthew, another guy, another name for him was Levi. He was the tax collector. We know him, but he was of that tribe of Levi. He was of that priestly tribe, perhaps. So he had a, a heart for reaching them, and that's why his book reflects that of the lion, that of the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Mark, you'll find associated, I believe, with, with the calf, with, with the ox there, okay? The ox was a creature that was often under the yoke. That's the best thing you can use an ox for, is just, just bearing a burden, throwing a big old weight on him and letting him pull it, letting him drag that thing through. And in Mark, you're going to find it just like story after story after story after story reflects Jesus and his labors and his work. It's just, he's going from one miracle to one preaching event to one miracle to one, you know, uh, story and parable. He's teaching, he's preaching, it's just constant. That's the book where you find his disciples literally saying, Master, take a break. Master, eat something. They're just begging him to stop. He's like the ox in that book, and I find that Mark really reflects that side of Jesus. In Luke, you'll find it as the beast that had the face of a man. You'll find, you'll find Luke is a book, being that Luke was a physician, right? He was associated with men and with, with the healing of men. Uh, you'll find Jesus referred to as the son of man. You'll find Jesus performing many, many miracles and healings that aren't necessarily in the other Gospels. He's the great physician in this book. You'll also find in Luke very long parables where Jesus will go and speak to people and give them a spiritual truth with a great big, almost like chapter-long parable trying to engage with the hearts of men, trying to, trying to get them on board with spiritual truths by giving them the parable of, of, the, of the lost son, the good Samaritan, and, and the, the many different parables and likenesses to spiritual things that Jesus brings down. And finally, John, the eagle. The beast of the eagle that, that is brought forth, and all, honestly, you find Jesus most revealed in this, as that, as that soaring God, as that king. And every chapter almost has a theme associated with Jesus Christ. And that whole book was re written and given to us for the purpose that, as the eagle did, so we can soar, right? We can believe in Jesus. We can go on into everlasting life. We can be given wings and take flight and go to be with Christ forever and ever and ever. And that eagle book, that, that book of John invites us to do so. It's an interesting study. You can go and you can look through all these parables and I encourage you to do so. You can go and read through these different gospels and see the likenesses that I think I have detected. But the one thing that I want to get a hold of regarding these spiritual creatures that is most important to me is the song that they sing. And I said that the title of this was going to be Holy, 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 Worthy, O Lord. And this is the song at the end of verse 8. This is the, the proclamation. This is, this is the call that these seraphs make over and over and over. And that's Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And they, they constantly keep singing this out. This is the trice holy God. Here, here you have contained in the scriptures another picture of the Trinity. In fact, that they have to call out holy, 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 not once, but three times. 
In John chapter 17, and you can go to Luke chapter 1 if you want. John chapter 17, we find the prayer that Jesus made for his disciples. And there in his prayer, he said, Holy Father, keep through thine own name these which thou hast given me. It's the one time that you find Jesus, any time in the scriptures, that, that statement made, Holy Father, Holy Father. Today, Catholics want to give that to their Pope, but the truth is that's blasphemy. Holy Father, the only Holy Father that we have is the creator of all. But we also know of the Holy Spirit. If you go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 30, I'll begin to explain and to show you where this comes in. Luke chapter 1 and verse 30, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth the Son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, and here it is, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And so see, we see here the statement, Holy Father made in John. And now here the Holy Spirit is giving the proclamation that the holy thing, the Son of God, the Holy Son, would be birthed of a virgin at this time. And so we see the trice Holy Father, the trice Holy Spirit, and the trice Holy God given in the context of scriptures. This is the triunity that we notice. This is God, the one that sits on the throne, being declared in his three persons, being declared in his three, the Father, the Spirit, the Son. These beasts have it right. You can go back to Revelation chapter 4. These beasts know what they're doing. They're resting not day or night. They're, they're constantly engaged in praise and in worship to the holy God. They're constantly just crying, holy, 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 over his throne. They're just overwhelmed with it. With us, things tend to fade, right? We get really excited about a movement. We get really excited about an event. We get really excited about church, about leading our families, about loving people, about soul winning. We get really excited about these things, but they fade away. Yet these angels, they rest not day or night. They're not giving up. They're not going to stop. Just holy, 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 holy. They're just going to keep giving praise and homage unto the God, the creator of all. And here their cry sparks a chain reaction. Every single time that they cry out, look at verse 9, it says, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. And so here, every single time that they cry out, holy, 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 and make a declaration like he is, which is, and which is to come. Every single time they cry out and say, holy, 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 the creator of all, holy, 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 thou art worthy. The angels make those statements, make those proclamations, and those four and twenty elders fall down before him. We see the angels here, they give glory. They give high renown unto God. They give honor. They give high esteem unto God. They give thanks. They give high gratitude unto God, to the Most High God, and to Him that sits on the throne, to Him that lives forever and ever, to Him that is only righteous, to Him that is only good. They constantly give renown, esteem, gratitude, and every single time that these great angelic beasts give these things, these great elders grovel before his feet. They fall down at his feet and they praise him and they worship him. And the end of that verse says, And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I have to wonder what it was like for John to step into heaven. And he had just fell at the feet of his dead. And Jesus said to him, get up, right? Get up. 
Get up, get up before me. It's okay. It's I. It is I, right? He sees Jesus and he's and he's now glorified. He sees Jesus and he's in he's in his glorified state. He's he's resurrected. He's now with with the long white hair. He is now in his priestly garments. He is now he is now not the humble servant but the reigning king. And he falls before him, and then now he's given this next vision. He steps before the throne of God, and now he sees great angelic beasts giving praise and honor and glory and thanks unto him. And then he sees these great elders. Like I said, maybe they're the 12 tribes, the heads of those, and the 12 apostles. I don't know exactly who they are at this time, but he sees these great men who were given prestige with a crown upon their heads, fall at his feet and end every time cast their crowns. It's almost like every single time they just they just shed their crowns and they say, I'm not worthy, but thou art worthy, God, to receive this glory, to receive this honor, to receive this power. And every single time they cast these crowns before them, it's like Christ gets up and he says, hey, you're with me. You're leading. You're serving. You're, you are my minister. You've earned these crowns and almost gives them back to them because time and time and time and time again, though there is no time in heaven, every single time these angelic beasts give glory unto God. These great, our, these great elders grovel at his feet and fall at his feet as dead. This passage here indicates that the crown and the curious creatures alike, those, those, those wonderful, fantastic creatures that we will behold one day in heaven and just go, whoa, the ones that have been seen upon earth in, in very few revelations, albeit, but have been seen and have left men as dead because their glory was so wondrous to, to behold. These curious creatures and the crowned in heaven alike have the same attitude when it comes to being before God. They give utmost reverence. They give utmost fear unto him that sitteth upon the throne. And they just lift him up like he couldn't be any higher. And they fall as low as they possibly can in order to give him his rightful place in their life. Now what about us? Okay, we're not there yet, but the day is coming we will be. But what about us? Do we give glory? Do we give honor? Do we give thanks unto God that is due his holy name? Do we cast ourselves? Are we setting ourselves aside and, and, and setting aside our self-worth, our, our self-recognition, our, our, our self-esteem, everything about me? Am I just setting it aside in order that God would get the utmost of me, the utmost of glory would be his, honor and thanks would be his, or, or are we doing too often taking those things for ourselves? Lifting up our own worth, lifting up our own recognition, lifting up our own esteem, taking glory to ourselves for things that God did in our lives, giving thanks unto others for things that, and miracles that God has done for us, giving honor unto people in our lives or esteeming and bringing honor unto ourselves for things that happen and getting glory unto ourselves. Every day are we doing as these angels are constantly, day in, day out, night in, night out, without rest? Are we... Being mindful to give glory, to give honor, to give thanks unto God, casting yourself to the side, putting yourself as, 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 as the least esteemed in the sight of God in order that he would be lifted up. Is this our attitude every day? It should be, okay? I'm falling short here even as I stand here. But this is not only a great privilege for us to be able to give glory unto God, to know him, to have him as your father, to have a relationship with him, and to give him his proper due. It's a great privilege for us, but it's also the great purpose for which each and every one of us was made. I'm not, if you're, not sure if you're aware of this, but that's what it says in verse 11. Thou art worthy was the call of those that cast their crowns before the Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. This worthy Lord is worthy to receive glory. He's worthy to receive power. He's worthy to receive honor because he made all things. And the purpose that he made all of these things is plain for his own pleasure. God didn't create things that would rebel against him. He didn't create things so that they would be a front to him. He didn't create things that, that would kick back against him and constantly being fighting against him and constantly putting him down and lifting themselves up. God created everything for his own pleasure. That's the purpose that we are all in this world. From, from, from the rebellious derelict to the, to the saint in the pulpit. 
from, 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 the, from the wicked heathen to, to, the, to the glorified saint in heaven. From the lost burning in hell to the resurrected saints that will sit at the right hand of God. No matter who you are, God created you for his own purpose. And we need to get that into our perspective. We need to understand that our life isn't about pleasing ourselves. Our life isn't about pleasing our families. Our life isn't about pleasing our church. Our life isn't about pleasing our boss. Though God puts all of these things in the proper order so that to the end, he would be pleased. So what is God's plan for you? What is God's purpose for you? What is God's will in your life? It's his own pleasure. Everything revolves and is centered on God being pleased. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. So go and work your works. Go and toil your labors, even in things that are godly on the outside. If you're not pleasing God by doing these things of faith, then you are not pleasing God. The purpose and end of all of God's creation is that he would be glorified. And when we get a picture of heaven, when we get a picture of the throne room of God, that's exactly what is going on day and night without rest. Just lifting up God, just glorifying God, just giving praise unto God, just giving thanks unto God. And we need a lot more of that in our lives. Hey, you want a little piece of heaven? People often say, hey, we're living, on he we're living in hell on earth. Things are so rotten here, right? Ah, oh, we're living in hell on earth. But all these people want eventually something that is better. Something that is better is glorifying God. Hell is a place where, yes, people will be crying out to God. They'll finally give the glory that he deserves, but it'll be too late for them to receive the blessings that come back. Because I believe, like I said, every single time they cast their crowns, God would give them back to them. He would bless them for it. He would encourage them for those things. But the beginning of it all was that glory was given unto him. Honor was given unto him. Thanks was given unto him. You want a piece of heaven today? Give God those things. And allow God to lead you because you have appropriately put him in the proper position in your life. That's the reason why you were made. That is the purpose of your life. That is going to be the only thing that actually brings you real joy in the day that we live in. is to please God. God, by faith, give him his proper recognition and put yourself in the proper place where you belong. Don't lift up your own worth. Don't seek after recognition. Don't lift up your own self-esteem. Let God do those things for you. Lay down yourself. Lay down your crown. Lay down your purposes. Lay down your plans. Lay down your own self-worth and let God give you all those things back and more because you have appropriately given him the glory and appropriately lifted him up, abased yourself before he had to do it before you so that you could be lifted up by God that loves you. And this is, the, this is the, the major theme that I see in the book of Revelation is that every single time that God is acting, he's doing it in order that men would finally wake up and say, God, you're God. Lord, you are the Lord. Lord, you, you rule. You reign. You're, you're the master. You're the boss. You're in control of everything. It's amazing when you read later on in the book of Revelation that men see him returning. They have, they have been through his judgments. They have been through his wrath, and they're still going to say, no, nope, you're not getting glory. You're not my God. Blaspheming the very creator as he returns. But we have the opportunity to do what's right. We have the opportunity to look at what's going on in heaven now and have a little bit of slice of it right now, today where we're at. Give God the glory. Give God the thanks. Give God the praise for everything that's going on in your life and, and allow him to lift you up and to give you that crown back and to give you that encouragement back and to give you the ability to do what? Praise him more. I love this book. Thank you, Father, for this day, God. I pray